With the mega success of the class shooter genre and the more popular known genre spawned from it, the hero genre, many titles attempted to catch some of the success that Overwatch and Paladins are profiting from. While some major titles faltered, titles we have covered on this very series, such as Cliff Bozinski's Lawbreakers and Randy Pitchford's Battleborn, there were yet more to join the fray, offering more innovation in some respects or a unique take on a familiar formula. Developed by Ninja Theory and published by Microsoft, and unlike hero shooters before, Bleeding Edge, as it was titled, would be unique and drive inspiration from action and fighting games such as Devil May Cry and Kung Fu Chaos, complete with a totally striking cyberpunk retro vibe art style to boot. While Bleeding Edge was able to garner a cult fanbase as a team-based multiplayer brawler, the game was ultimately unable to garner enough of an audience and Ninja Theory would shut down development of the title at the start of 2021, a mere year after launch. What went wrong with Bleeding Edge, detectives? How did Ninja Theory fumble a title relatively in their comfort zone? Come join me on this episode where we diagnose the largest contributing factors to the death of a game, Bleeding Edge. Originally started as a company in March 2000 in Cambridge, England under a different name, Ninja Theory's largest profile later on would be the successful reboot of a successful Capcom action series, Devil May Cry. Devil May Cry was developed by Ninja Theory, published by Capcom in a total reimagination with a Dante visual and character shift largely taken negatively by fans of the series. Despite the drama concerning the legitimacy of the remake and Capcom's usage of a Western developer and Ninja Theory to create the game, Devil May Cry would launch on January 2013 and would be received rather positively commercially and according to fans. DMC would sell well over 5 million copies, resulting in arguably Ninja Theory's first commercial hit. While Ninja Theory would go on to make the very successful Hellblade series, we're not going to discuss that on this video. Ninja Theory's next title would be a departure from the single-player world after these two titles, but right up the same alleyway in terms of a third-person action brawl and combat system, especially taking inspiration from Devil May Cry. According to the source of mine, this title, which would be dubbed Bleeding Edge, would originally begin development as a fighting game prototype back in 2014 before later becoming a MOBA. It didn't take long for the title to then shift to becoming more of a hero hybrid shooter. Unlike previous Ninja Theory projects spearheaded by Nina Christensen or Tamim Antonidis, who wrote and designed DMC, Bleeding Edge would utilize Ronnie Tucker as the lead creative director on the project, accompanied by the senior designer Gerald Poon, both of which had significant game development experience at THQ previously. With a small team of 15 or so developers, there was a bit more creative freedom in a trip off the beaten path regarding Bleeding Edge and its development cycle. Effectively, it was a passion project turned game according to Ninja Theory themselves. This could serve as a double-edged sword going forward. Ninja Theory would forever change as a company when they would be acquired by Microsoft June 2018. Ninja Theory stated that they joined Microsoft to be free from the AAA machine. What that exactly means, I'm not exactly sure, but one thing's for sure. Now Ninja Theory wouldn't need to hunt for funding anymore. They had it in-house. Bleeding Edge would take art inspiration from a number of animes, including Ghost in the Shell and Akira. Those would prove to be too serious of a tone for the game overall, however, and over time the art would shift towards more of a cell-shaded looking style like the anime Tekken Concrete or the popular looter shooter Borderlands. After a number of leaks would hit the web concerning Ninja Theory working on a multiplayer hero brawler project, they would officially announce Bleeding Edge at E3 2019. A 4 vs 4 online action game with three archetypes of fighting, assassin, support, or a heavy slash tank, as well as having different heroes would feature different unique art styles and abilities. Bleeding Edge would feature two main modes of gameplay including objective control, which was a capture and defend mode, and power collection, which was obtaining enough resources to win. A technical alpha was slated for June 27, 2019, with sign-up starting on the 10th. Not much else was detailed in the press releases, instead Ninja Theory showed off some flashy and fast-paced teaser trailer footage announcing their new project.
Bleeding Edge's beta would occur in February of 2020, and was being received rather positively, enough especially to attract the attention of other content creators. One of those was YouTuber ACG, who in his beta impressions of Bleeding Edge, while positive about the fun factor of the game, was critical of the solid direction for the heroes included in the game. They are sort of all over the place, to be fair. Some characters are incredibly interesting looking, while others seem like borrowings from other different games such as League of Legends, Overwatch, and Heroes of the Storm. The characters seem like the team basically chose everything they liked and then found a way to put it in the game even if it didn't necessarily fit the theme. Beta impressions were largely positive concerning Bleeding Edge overall though. The main negative point, besides the aforementioned character identity, was concerning the longevity of the title. So many hero shooters and similar titles we have already covered on this series have made mistakes such as launching without ranked modes, having little to no long-term progression systems, but worst of all, both games in particular, Lawbreakers and Battleborn, made a fatal mistake when launching their projects launching as paid projects. Battleborn would go free-to-play ultimately too late, and Lawbreakers would never make the promise switch ending in the sunsetting of that game. Bleeding Edge was already out of the gate making a fatal mistake. It was launching with either the box price of a $30 option, or the Xbox Game Pass option. A $30 price tag in 2020 was a hard ask for many players, especially when at this point they were already playing the games that Bleeding Edge was, well, attempting to compete with. For those who had the Game Pass, this meant that they got the game for free, which was a good deal. The issue was that the Xbox Game Pass historically had been used for single player games, and a cheap barrier to entry isn't the same as no barrier to entry. Not at all, in fact. By putting a price tag on Bleeding Edge no matter how small, if they chose the Game Pass route, Ninja Theory was taking a risk of dooming their multiplayer online title with not enough players, resulting in a dead population. And worse of all, a dead game. As soon as population would drop, or simply not be high enough at launch, that $30 price tag to entry would seem like a King Kong-worthy barrier to prospective players. Bleeding Edge would launch March 24, 2020, to a 70% positive review score at mostly positive. The player base would peak on Steam at 828 players, with 479 on average. This is not counting the population on Xbox. An aggregate review website Metacritic, Bleeding Edge would score a lower 62 out of 100 from 18 different critics. The website True Achievements, in short, thought that Bleeding Edge was a fun third-person action game, but needed a ranked mode and more game modes in general to be more successful. PC Gamer scored Bleeding Edge a 58 out of 100, expressing that the characters in Bleeding Edge are cool, but the combat is too shallow to hold the attention for long. US Gamer wasn't any more positive about the game, granting it a 2.5 out of 5, describing Bleeding Edge as having good ideas, but not having enough content or progression to back them up. There simply wasn't enough content in the ways of maps, as the game only launched with 6 maps, and the game only had 13 characters or heroes that it launched with as well, and then finally the game modes, well, Bleeding Edge only had 2 of those, and they were nothing new or revolutionary, and they didn't launch with a ranked mode. And with a lukewarm reception and no roadmap publicly released, Bleeding Edge's future already so early on was in trouble. At this point, it was a matter of how long could Ninja Theory continue to spend money and resources on developing a game that might not pay off or have enough players left so early after launch. While they could potentially bring things around, the speed at which they had to do it alone could prove fatal. When your game's online, has a price tag, and is already suffering from a gaping hole of lacking content, things were already looking problematic for the newly launched hero shooter, as those things made prospective players completely turned off from wanting to even try the game out. The population for Bleeding Edge in May of 2020 dropped significantly peaking at a mere 101 players and 39 players on average. Staggeringly low numbers for a title so early on in its life cycle. It didn't matter what changes were promised at this point. Even if Bleeding Edge were to suddenly go free to play and a significant effort was put out for marketing, there potentially just wouldn't be enough population to even find a match. Rumors would hit the web in October of 2020 that Bleeding Edge might be abandoned by Ninja Theory. Not hard to see the truth behind the rumors when Bleeding Edge's website, blog, social media, and developer Discord had all gone radio silent. Ninja Theory unfortunately, but expectedly, which shut down development for Bleeding Edge January 2021, less than a year after the game launched originally. The server wouldn't be brought down immediately, but development for the title would completely cease and Ninja Theory would shift their focus to their other projects, such as Sonoa Saga, the sequel to their successful Hellblade title, Project Mara, a horror-based title, and the Insight Project, which was a clinical neuroscience game design research program of sorts. 
Just like that though, the end of the story comes so quick for Bleeding Edge, as even though the servers are technically still online after they stop development, no one is really playing the game anymore. The game, unlike other titles we have covered on the series, didn't get a reboot, or a private server, or a resurrection, or really even a happy ending. Once Ninja Theory shuts down the live servers, Bleeding Edge will truly be gone. A short-lived, wild-action online brawler that burned out as fast as it caught fire as a passion project turned a new game. Bleeding Edge's issues should be quite apparent by this point, especially for those who have seen other videos in the Death of a Game series, you veteran detectives. We see many of the same mistakes being made here, including the cardinal sin of launching Sans Ranked Mode and with too lean of an offering for a 2020 title. Another one of the large mistakes we haven't really covered so far is concerning the very core design of the game, which could contribute to why it was ultimately unsuccessful. When Ronnie Tucker was asked about making a game like Bleeding Edge, the rhetoric was, well, nobody has done it before, which I think can be quite dangerous, especially in hindsight. Sometimes there's a good reason why developers haven't done something yet, and I think making a fighting game based hero shooter might have seemed attractive at first glance, but there's sort of a good reason why developers haven't made such a thing. The big issue with Bleeding Edge's combat is the fighting system. You can get comboed and stuck in hit stun. Sure, you can evade and you can escape, kind of, but throw in some teammates and suddenly you realize the game is more team-centric than even Heroes of the Storm and even Overwatch. Bleeding Edge was all about teamwork and staying together. However, issue being, this was only felt extrinsically and not intrinsically. You more so work with your teammates in Bleeding Edge because, well, you have to. Otherwise, you're gonna be cannon fodder out there. Especially with larger than average maps, you really have to stick together. What was the game really trying to be anyway, though? Originally a fighting game, then a MOBA, then a hero shooter hybrid. In the end, Bleeding Edge is all three, but I think it does them individually poorer than its respective competition, which is often the curse of a hybrid identity. This issue, along with the overall art style and character design issues previously mentioned, are compacted. When Ninja Theory refers to Bleeding Edge as a passion project turned game, well, I think it never stopped being a passion project. And that's not good enough to sustain an audience or have enough longevity, especially when you're charging a $30 price tag for it. A passion project can be a negative thing because that very often means that the target audience wasn't really taken into account. They're not really sure that the game even has an audience. So you're making a game without really even being sure if anybody's asking for it. It's a bold risk. Worst of all, Ninja Theory even admitted pre-launch that they didn't have a content roadmap planned out. Even if they promised support, it ended up being just that promises. In the end, it seemed like they didn't really have a serious long-term plan for the game. Where did Ninja Theory go wrong concerning Bleeding Edge? Well, it's that time of the video where the music starts playing, things get a little bit hype, and I make sure you guys have been keeping up with the clues so far concerning the largest contributing factors for the death of a game, Bleeding Edge. Not enough content to keep players interested. Lacking core competitive shooter features from 2004. A crisis of identity. It was a 3-in-1, a MOBA, hero shooter, and a fighting game. A passion project that cost $30. No long-term vision or planning. And just like that, we have the end of this case, detectives. Sometimes the story is, well, it's that short. Sometimes there isn't some complex answer to it all, or some deeper meaning. Sometimes the simplest answer is the right answer, and it's there, staring you right in the face. Hindsight is always 2020, but Bleeding Edge is simply put, a story of not learning of previous failures in the market space. At this point, in 2021, with the accessibility of the internet, it's a bit perplexing to me to see these things happen when, well, things are just more widely known at this point. Until developers and projects learn, though, the same mistakes will continue to be the dagger or daggers to fell the beast. You can't launch an online shooter without ranked, guys. Please copy pasta that and share it when shooters launch without a ranked mode. And maybe they'll learn something. Thanks for watching, guys. At the dawn of the industrial age, the power of the machine granted us a great abundance 